Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Damien. Okay, I, I shall begin once again. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Lamari, and I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Today's event will encompass an overview and discussion of an emerging specification. This is ongoing work at ID Union to bridge the gap between OpenID for VC and DIDCOM. Today's event will begin with a presentation both by Arthur Phillip of ID Union and Sam Curran from Indicio. Following this, we will have time for Q&A and discussion. So feel free to also drop questions in the chat along the way. Maybe something you don't want to forget as it comes up. Europeans. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce our first guest, who is Sam Curran, who in addition to his work at Indicio, also serves as a member of the steering committee and also the technical steering committee here at DIFF. Welcome, Sam, and go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Lamar. I appreciate that. Um, and so this is not uh, the meeting format as a regular Zoom call so that we can have better questions and interactions. Um, and so please, uh, but in, in light of that, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question. Um, and then as we ask questions, we can get more interactive. Um, so perfect. Um, uh, thanks, and I'm glad to be here. Um, the, um, um, are you pinned, Lamari? You might be. Oh, no, it's probably just me, because it's me. Perfect. Okay. So um, the, um, the topic is one that's really cool here today. Um, several of you may have seen me uh, present about this at IIW. I was doing that because uh, Archer was unable to attend or, or others that were working on the project. Luckily, uh, you have the real deal here today in the form of Archer, and so uh, th this is uh, this is a great chance to be able to talk about this and and do a deep dive. We'll go ahead and talk about some of the higher level things, and then get into specifics about how this uh, how this the, this, um, this proposed uh, approach works, and uh, and then we'll be able to take questions and 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 everything else. Um, so that's the plan going forward. Um, Archer, um, you have been involved in this work from the beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, uh, and then we can, uh, before we get into the, the idea of what's going on here. Yeah, thanks. Dad. Thanks for um, having me. So my name is Arthur Philip. Uh, I work for a company called SVA Systemvertrieb Alexander um, in Germany. And I'm also involved in the ID Union project. So maybe some of you may have heard of it. It's yeah one of four bigger uh, showcase projects in Germany, which deal uh, about the decentralized identity or secure digital identities in general. And um, yeah, when ID Union started it was about in 2021, the idea was to figure out how to create a decentralized ecosystem of uh, self-sovereign identities. And we started with a tech stack uh, called Hyperledger Indian, I guess most of you are familiar with it. Um, so we have some kind of ledger which we use for our showcase, for our demo showcases. We have some kind of agent and um, based on that, we started approaching the, the whole topic of self-sovereign identity. And yeah, I don't know, Sam, if you want me to just hand over to the real topic about it or uh, sure. Uh, yeah, um, that would that, that would be just fine. The, we want to we want to talk about uh, you know what this basics of this this project is. Uh, it's been named OpenIDcom, sort of the, the merge of the OpenID and, and Didcom labels. Um, so uh, so give us the basic idea and and how it came to be. Uh, yeah, sure. So basically, um, I guess most of you know about Didcom and. Um... In order to explain it, uh, I, I think I have to tell the story how ID Union evolved because we started, as I mentioned, with Hyperledger in the thing. So we had our ledger, we had our agents, mainly um, Iris Cloud, Agent Python. And in order to do some credential exchange, uh, basically issuance and presentation, verification of credential, we used DITCOM for this, uh, which is good. I mean, you can issue and present credential with DITCOM, but you can do so much more than just present credentials or uh, verify credentials. And that being said, in the meanwhile, the, the whole world changed and something with the neuro, um, with the name IDAS 2.0 uh, showed up. Um, yeah, it's a new regulation which defines how um, yeah entities um, have to deal with digital identities of people in Europe in the future. And not only that it is a new regulation, it also defines from a technical point of view how to issue these kind of identities or credentials to people and request presentation of these kind of credentials. 
And basically with IDAS 2.0, there comes something that is called the architecture reference framework. And the architecture reference framework prescribes from a technical point of view, um, how to, to uh, issue credentials and to request credentials mainly. Um, it defines that it has not to be done by using DITCOM, but it has to be done uh, using something else, mainly OpenID for VCI, verified credential issuance, and OpenID for verifiable credential presentation. And we at IDUnion figured out, well, okay, I mean, since this is a regulation which is valid for, for within whole Europe, of course, we have to adapt somehow. We have to evolve our tech stack. We have to comply with the specifications which are mentioned in this regulation there. But then we figure, figured out, well, yes, with our so-called tech stack 1.0 within IDUnion, we were able to issue credentials, present credentials, and to do any kind of uh, message transfer data message exchange using DITCOM. But although OpenID for VCI and OpenID for VP are really, really good in order to issue and present credentials, you cannot transfer arbitrary data, meaning you cannot send a message from A to B just saying hi or vice versa. And then we figured out, well, um, for many, many use cases, we need this kind of features in order to be able to communicate between holder and issuer or between holder and verifier. And then the idea came up to, well, we need something that A, is compliant with IDAS 2.0 and the architecture reference framework, but also to add the features which are not given by OpenID for VC and VP beyond uh, just issuance and verification of credentials. And yeah, basically that's that's the story how, how this uh, working group um, started because we figured out we need it. We need DITCOM as message functionality when doing um, issuance and presentation with OpenID for VC and VP. Thanks for the backstory. Um, I uh, I first heard about this project mm -hmm. after it had already begun, um, and then uh, and then I reached out to to, to Arthur, and uh, and he invited me to participate. And they're very kind because uh, it's within ID Union. There are German speakers within Germany, and so when I joined, they kindly speak to English uh, or switch to English because my my German is terrible, um, as in non-existent. And so they they've been very kind to me. Um, and so I've been kind of monitoring and watching, not as a core contributor, but just you know offering a little bit of feedback here and there. And and, and the work's been uh, been pretty fantastic. Um, so you already kind of covered a, a little bit of an intro about what Didcom is good at and what OpenID uh, for VC uh, protocols are, are are good at. And so um, that uh, that helps to um, helps to set a little bit of, of a foundation. Um, you mentioned a little bit about ID Union doing the work. Um, is uh, who's, who's all involved in this project? Yeah, I mean, um, it's originated from ID Union. So basically because we within ID Union figured out or had to figure out how to adapt to the new IDAS 2.0 regulation. Um, but I mean, as you already mentioned beyond that, of course, um, you are involved also the colleagues from Spherian showed uh, a lot of interest and we plan to open this okay. more up and also collaborate a little bit more with diff and yeah that's um work in progress and hopefully it will be more accessible to to everybody else because from my point of view it's something at least it fits me that it's not only id union who needs something like open my didcom basically saying using didcom beyond open id for vc and vp absolutely and uh, in the however the work proceeds forward, the work is going, which is which is great. And so that's uh, that's really nice. Um, I'd love to get a little bit into the details of of how uh, of how our proposed solution actually works. Do you want to share? Should I share? Um, I mean, you can share. I mean, probably you're going to open the same specs anyway, in case you want to okay, show yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll, I'm going to drop a link into the chat for anyone who wants to read along without having to be forced to follow along with what we happen to be looking at. And so this is the GitHub repo where the uh, where the work lives. Let me see if I can manage to share the correct window. And I have. Uh, OK, so um, this is the this is the, the, the repo repository itself. Um, and uh, the README file here, there's uh, there's some working code and some other things here, but uh, but the main README contains a lot of background of, of this project. So it has some explanation. We've covered all some of this, so we're not going to walk all the way through it. Um, in, in the in the beginning, it, it discusses and has links to the relevant specifications for OpenID for for VCI and VP, and um, as well as as Didcom and some relevant links there. 
uh, the background kind of gives you some some flows that are common inside of um, uh, inside of uh, OAuth, which the OpenID for VCI and VP uh, protocols are based on, or at least VCI. So um, there's this uh, there's this process generally of of submitting an authorization request and getting granted that, presenting the grant for an access token, and then and then uh, trading the access token for a protected resource. That's been applied into the the OpenID for VCI uh, spec to to mean that the resource, the protected resource, is the credential that you are having issued, um, and so. Um, you know, you can go through some sort of a, a login process. Um, you 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 get uh, authorization, um, and then you can uh, submit a token request, an, an, an access token request. Be given that, that you can then trade for a credential, and that's generally how that works. There's an auth flow and a pre-auth flow. Both of the flows notably make a request for a uh, for an access token and then receive that. Um, and so that is actually the same, even though the earlier steps of the flow are different. That is the same. Um, and then uh, there's a discussion about like what the goals actually were, and, and Archer's talked a little bit about that um, in the sense that, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, support the, the OpenID protocols but not lose the ability to engage with the other party using, uh, using other uh, DIDCOM-based protocols uh, to, for that additional functionality that, uh, that they're looking for. Um, within their use cases, and so uh, one of the one of the requirements from early on was that this should either be made for the participants involved. This should either be made optional or required. Um, optional in the sense that maybe you come out with a, with the DIDCOM uh, connection um, uh, at the other end, or or the issuer can actually require that a DIDCOM connection exists in order to issue the credential. Um, in a, if they have a, a use case that that needs um, you know the DIDCOM connection to exist for for other purposes uh, within the ecosystem. Um, so there was, a, we discussed a lot of things in the working group and I am not going to do uh, the, the history justice here. It's, it's a really long discussion, but we arrived at a solution um, that, uh, that is the current proposed solution that involves access tokens and how to correlate a DIDCOM uh, connection with an open ID interaction. And so uh, that's what we'll be uh, detailing here today as part of that process. Um, is it a good idea to send credential offers over DIDCOM do you, uh, the, is the question. Do you mean open ID credential offers? And if so, yes, that's one of the things that is under discussion. Uh, it is not something that we're going to show here today. Um, but if you have an existing DIDCOM relationship, you can absolutely send an open ID uh, credential offer um, and then complete the rest of the protocol using open ID in a standard form. Um, so that's absolutely something that we can do. Um, Maybe to maybe to add here because yeah, we have this two kind of flows right we have the authorization code flow where the whole interaction between um the, the holder and the issuers starts and we can also have the pre-authorized code flow where uh, the assumption is that there was some discussion or communication between the holder and the issuer going on before and it could be based on didcom so i think that even is a pretty uh, good example to to demonstrate how didcom uh, could support the pre-authorization code flow here because it's, I mean, somehow it has to be transferred. And I'm, um, I'm speaking about a credential offer and it's not specified how. Could be a QR code. I think that's a classical way to do it. But when you are in a relationship with, uh, with an issue already via DITCOM, why not just share the, the invitation via the DITCOM message itself? Yes, and the work to, to, to demonstrate how that can be done will, will be coming along pretty soon. That, that was not considered the sort of the hard nut to crack. And so we focused on the, on the difficult bit uh, initially, um, but that will be coming along soon. So, um, so here's how the, the flow works, and there's some excellent diagrams in here. I will note that um, there's, um, as far as uh, the, the actual, like, you know, either capitalization or other things, that there may be some minor corrections here. Don't get stuck on those uh, sorts of things in the proposal. Um, uh, but rather, you know, we can kind of highlight how this uh, interaction works. Um, if, if it seems simpler than you expected, that's, uh, that's a result of hard work. Uh, this was definitely the simplest uh, flow that we came up with um, and uh, that, that provides the necessary functionality. And so the goal of this work, uh, one of the things that I should mention was to not require really any changes to the OpenID uh, protocols. Um, uh, and uh, but but still allow the whole interaction to happen. So this is a little bit of an overlay thing that you can add on without like losing compatibility with the rest of, of the you know OpenID implementers as it as it progresses. Um, so the most useful bit here, uh, right here in the beginning of the of the of the README, is this flow that shows the flow between a wallet and an issuer. 
um, to, to, to do this. And, and we, we're assuming in this particular flow in the common case that there hasn't been previous interaction between these two, that the wallet is going to then begin interaction with the issuer just sort of as part of that process. Um, and um, the um, there's this, we actually don't show the, the, inv the invitation process to issue a credential here, but that's, that's kind of what happens right before this, this occurs. Um, there's a, uh, within the, the OpenID for VCI spec, there's this concept, of, well, I guess it borrows it from OAuth, there's this concept of issuer metadata or metadata about the other party. And there are two additional fields uh, that we insert um, into this. Um, into this JSON structure. Uh, JSON allows for additional data to be present without, uh, without changing really the parsing or, or uh, if someone doesn't expect a value, it should not cause a problem. Um, and so this is a gentle way to introduce some, some additional metadata required. And there's two things. Um, one is the did of the issuer. This may be known by other methods, um, but indicating that this is the did that should be used to open a, a didcom relationship between the wallet and the issuer. And this is again related to the issuer, and you can see that we've we've chosen an example did here to indicate that. The second piece is a is a is a signal whether the didcom connection is required or optional prior to credential issuance. And this is a a flag to the wallet to understand what the what the um, expected behavior should be. And all the black stuff is just examples of what already exists within that metadata. Um, and then there's a difference here between the authorized flow and the pre-authorized flow that Arthur was talking about, uh, where um, there's an authorization request and a response, or simply a token request and a token response. I'm going to focus on the on the um, on the authorization token request and response here. So um, the, the the bottom half of, of both of these flows, and when you make that request, um, the the OpenID for VCI spec. I'll uses the scope argument here within the within the payload to indicate the types of credentials that you're seeking to have issued to you. This is often specified in the invitation itself um, as, as part of that, that initial process. And what we do is we add an additional didcom scope uh, to this list of, of credentials. Um, the scope actually comes from OAuth, and the uh, the intent there is that the access token that is provided that you're seeking to get or is provided um, can be used within several different scopes. This is often uh, used to access several different systems within a larger ecosystem or several different resources that you're seeking access to. And so the, the use of DIDCOM here is very much in line if you view uh, DIDCOM as a resource that you're seeking to gain access to. So uh, you include uh, DIDCOM here, and then it's provided in the, to, in the token response also includes DIDCOM as a scope. There's also an access token. Uh, you can see here there's, there's a, a randomish value with some dots to sort of truncate the value for, for brevity in the diagram. And that access token is then used uh, within the OpenID flows uh, to, to exchange that access token for the, 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 the credential as desired. And, and then here's the really where the interesting bit happens. Um, because the wallet understands that, uh, that a DIDCOM connection is required, and they have been granted uh, permission to use this access token for the DIDCOM scope, they use a protocol um, that we'll show here in a minute to, to, co to communicate over DIDCOM that access token uh, to the issuer, uh, the issuer did specified in the metadata. Um, at that point, the issuer can now correlate the access token provided over the OpenID interactions with a DIDCOM relationship with the other party. Um, potentially, this is a brand new one, but it can also be communicated over an existing relationship should they already have one to be able to correlate that behavior together. And then the last step here is simply that the, the OpenID credential request and, 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 um, and issuance uh, using the access token uh, happens as normal. And so that part of the, of the flow uh, happens entirely. There's the possibility if the issuer requires a DIDCOM connection and the wallet has not provided the access token that they can provide one of the already defined error codes um, uh, for OpenID, uh, for the OpenID issuance process that indicates that the credential you know, can't be provided yet. And that, re that allows a mechanism for the issuer to require the connection prior to issuing the credential um, itself. If it's optional that it did, uh, that a didcom relationship be created, then of course this doesn't have to happen uh, at all, or can actually happen after the the the, re the credentials actually been provided. And there's are variations in the flow there that allow for the flexibility needed for those using the protocol in an optional way. Um, 
And so that's basically the flow. You'll notice, of course, that the green stuff is the, is the stuff that we're adding, which helps highlight. And there's not very much that's actually uh, happening. Um, it should be noted that this DIDCOM protocol is also new. It's just not colored green because it's not, a, uh, it's not an addition to the, to the OpenID uh, data that's actually being passed. Um, so this was kind of a lot. I talked a lot. Arthur, is there anything you wish to clarify in the, uh, as, that we've described in the process here? No, I mean, basically that's it. Um, but as, as Sam said, it, it looks very simple. Add two attributes to this uh, metadata of, of the issuer called didcom did, didcom required, and that's it. But it took us a while to figure out that how to, to establish the correlation between um, the didcom channel and the OpenID for VCI flow, which is basically the, the, uh, the token. We did discuss several less optimal ways of doing so and, and, and then discarded those in favor of this approach. Um, this might be a good uh, time to open up and ask uh, if any uh, folks have questions about what we've described or, or, uh, or anything, any part of that process. Um, you're welcome to drop it in the chat or, or uh, you can uh, raise a hand and, and that way we can um, answer any questions that you might have. It looks like there is one in the chat. Oh, I did answer that a little bit earlier. That one? Okay. Um, I think, yeah. Um, and so we, I'll show you this protocol here in a second that we're proposing. We'll have another one for the pro, for providing of invitations. It will also be relatively simple, um, uh, but uh, but that isn't available for sharing yet. That process. Any other questions that we can answer, or maybe confusion that we can clarify? Well, everyone's so thoroughly confused they don't know the question to ask, or they're astounded by the brilliance of the solution that Arthur and his team have come up with. I'm going to go with the astounded option. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let me. Uh, the, the, we had a, a comparison of some different approaches and some and some further work indicated here. What I'd like to do is 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 uh, highlight that Didcom protocol, um, and and show. Oh, Sam, this there's here. a new question in the chat. Oh yeah. What about the offline capabilities like mobile to mobile or app to app? Um, can you clarify your question, Tobias? Is this the the offline capabilities of OpenID, or is this the offline capabilities of Didcom that we're discussing, or or both? Can you can you help clarify the question? Well, Tobias clarifies for a minute. I'm going to go navigate. to this file here. Um, this is a draft uh, protocol that is used in the code example, present in the same repository, uh, by the way. But um, this, uh, this is the, the, the DIDCOM protocol used to associate uh, the access token with the, with the DIDCOM relationship. Um, and so the, the, the OpenID token is, is presented uh, here. There's a, uh, an explicit acknowledgement back for the other party, uh, for the issuer to respond back and say, you know, yes, I'm, I'm receiving your token. You can expect that this has happened properly. There's also re a rejection error that can be returned if an access token was provided to the to the issuer that the issuer is unaware of or or not uh, or not available in any way there. Okay, so Tobias, uh, Didcom works perfectly offline, but for OpenID, you need the auth server, and so I do not see any solution which was running on mobile phones. Yeah, um, so it's true. Um, if you were able to, if you were uh, fully offline, the Didcom bits work, but of course the OpenID bits don't. And so in this particular flow, to establish the relationship, um, the, then everyone, you know, the, the, the wallet and the issuer both have to be online to make that occur. After this exchange, meaning the Didcom connection was created and, um, and the uh, credential was issued, now a Didcom relationship exists. And so all of the normal capabilities of Didcom kick into play in the sense that, um, that the, the mobile device can be off or disconnected from the network. Uh, messages can be sent because of the routing capability of Didcom. Um, and then when the device comes back online, uh, they'll be able to receive it. Um, there's also the, the capability of Didcom in that it's transport agnostic which allows for uh, communication over, uh, over Bluetooth. Um, that has, has been designed, it's, it's not been demonstrated as much as I would really like, and so hopefully that, that comes out in the future um, or is demonstrated in the future. But all of those abilities of DIDCOM are then present as soon as the DIDCOM relationship is actually created. 
Um, and so uh, there's no, but just for this one interaction, because of the dependence of OpenID to be online, um, then then you still you still in fact do need that. Um, I believe for OpenID for VP they have uh, they have or they're working on um, a device to device presentation flow um, that is part of that process. Um, but I'm not a particular expert in that, so I will attempt to not get myself in trouble uh, by by talking too deeply about the offline presentation capability or the device to device. Um, enabled by the OpenID for VP, and I believe PSYOP enables uh, some of that behavior as well. Um, so yes, this is the protocol um, that is used to associate those connections. Um, and the, um, there, the, 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 the process of passing an OpenID invitation will be a similarly simple protocol. Um, you'll notice that in these messages, you're not identifying the DIDCOM relationship that you wish to associate with the access token. And that's because this message passes in a um, in a in a, uh, a message encrypted using authenticated encryption, which means that um, that the process of passing the token over the DIDCOM connection helps you associate the 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 OpenID access token with the resulting DIDCOM connection that exists. Um, and so that's not shown explicitly here because it's an implicit feature of of DIDCOM that that exists. Um, but you're able to 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 associate those um, very securely. And so this is the piece not shown before, uh, but it's it's not a complicated uh, credential. Uh, one of the features of DIDCOM allows you to discover the features that the, the within DIDCOM that the other party supports. And so it's possible, for example, to discover um, that the other party supports the OpenID Associate protocol, um, which which uh, gains you know gives you some confidence that they're ready to receive those messages or or any other protocols if you're trying to discover the capabilities of messaging or or data transfer that that Arthur was talking about before, in the sense that you can pass more over DIDCOM than simply verifiable credential information. There's um, it's extensible, uh, much the way that for example a REST API is, and that you can define a DIDCOM protocol uh, for any reason and without permission. You can uh, you can just create one for your purposes. Of course, if you want to sort of spread uh, adoption of that particular protocol, you know, you need to work with the community or or whatever particular vertical you're seeking to to coordinate with to to make that happen. But uh, but that's the idea there. Any questions about the the DIDCOM piece of this? So I also have to say, if you feel like you're confused and you're worried that you're the only one who is, I guarantee you you're not. There may be, uh, there's likely someone else with the same question. And so please, uh, if you do have a question, even if you don't understand or you'd like us to go to dig in deeper or answer questions, then please ask. That's that's what this is here for, and that's how we all that's how we all learn together. So while we let folks contemplate questions, and, and please do ask if you if you have them, um, Archer, where uh, where do you see this work going? Um, we we've uh, we found a path that we think is going to work, and we're still validating it and, and receiving feedback on it. But uh, but but how do you see this being used um, in uh, in you know real life applications uh, when the ability to to use these protocols together uh, you know comes online? How, what what are the applications that you're you're anticipating for this? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, but it really depends on the use case you want to realize, right? Um, I, th I think having the opportunity um, to, to exchange messages between issuer and um, wallet and uh, uh, verify and wallet uh, is quite important, right? So after you issue the credential or even before you issue the credential to have some kind of uh, ex information exchange is something that you will need quite often. And it's a very simple example is when you got a credential issued and you have an established DITCOM channel, the issuer could inform the wallet for whatever reason your exchange is going to be revoked or you have to renew it or there's another offer for another credential or whatever, there's some expiry date. Um, I mean, the possibilities are endless from my point of view and it really depends on the use case. When you have a use case where you need interaction between issuer and wallet or verifier and wallet, beyond just the issuance or verification of credential, um, I believe that's something, then OpenID.com is something that you are going to need. And the current state of the project is that um, we mainly focus on the uh, on OpenID for VCI, so the issuance of credentials, and then establish the DITCOM channel. Um, the 
yeah, the challenge here is that you have more than one starting point and flow within each of the specifications. So in OpenID for VCI, for example, it can be initiated by the wallet, it can be initiated by the issuer. You have this authorization code flow without any interaction advance, and then you have the authorization code, uh, pre-authorized code flow where you had an interaction. And we, all these different kind of flows we have to consider and figure out a solution that works for every case. And yeah, hopefully we, we find something that works for every case. And if not, then we have to decide, um, yeah, how, how, how to deal with that. Also presentation of credentials with uh, OpenID for VP. Um, I mean, it's also based on OAuth 2.0 as OpenID for VCI is, but it's not the same thing. For example, we have no token here that we are going to use for OpenID for VCI in order to establish the correlation between uh, the OpenID for VCI flow and the DITCOM challenge. And I think all these edge cases I'm, I'm sure this still will take a, little, uh, take a little bit of time to be really, really sure that the solution or solutions we provide work for every case. And uh, I think one of the next steps is also to uh, talk to the friends from um, who, who mainly specify the OpenID for VCI and OpenID for VP specs, because the main goal is really to create something that does not interfere with OpenID for VCI and VP at all. So it's just an option to any wallet um, to, to, who complies to the spec to do it, but not to interfere to the original specifications. Then hopefully at the end, uh, end up with a spec that builds on top of OpenID for VCI, OpenID for VP, and integrate DITCOM. And I see there's a question from Tim. Yeah, so two, two questions. Um, just one, in the introduction, you talked about how um, the EU ID project started with DITCOM and ND and, and all of that. How much interest is there um, still in, in, in DITCOM within EU ID projects within these um, large scale pilots? Is it, is it niche or is it still, still quite strong in terms? I know it's obviously not in the EU RF directly, but is it, um, is it still? Um, a major consideration. I'm just wondering your thoughts are if you if, if that doesn't put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I'm not deeply involved in the large scale projects. Um, it's not like uh, DITs or DITCOM are banned from from large scale projects, but since the IDAS two regulation, mainly the architecture reference framework, does not mention DITs and DITCOM at all. Of course, the interest, uh, yeah. Was, was reduced because most of the people within the European Union or, or companies or governments, they want to be uh, compliant with IDAS 2.0 and the architecture reference framework. Um, somehow I have the feeling that at the end, it will be become more interesting again because then they will figure out, well, okay, we can issue and verify credentials, but we cannot communicate between the wallet and um, and the issuer and uh, the verifier. So yeah, um, I mean, from large scale pilot perspective, I don't have that many insights. It's not like we are not talking about did or did come at all, but the focus rather moves um, into what is uh, defined by the architecture reference framework. And that is OpenID for VCI and OpenID for VP. And I hope that this somehow gives an idea <laughs> what the current state is. Yeah, thank you. I guess the second question I think you might have answered, uh, this hasn't been presented yet to the, the core OpenID for VC team yet, or has, have they have gotten any feedback at all uh, from them? Or It hasn't been formally presented. It, th there's, yeah. a, there's a few folks that are aware of, uh, involved in that work and are aware of this and, and have, have had some review, but it's not been formally presented. Exactly. I mean, um, a lot of people from who started uh, within the ID Union project they started working on the OpenID for V for VCI spec. So um, I had a chance to speak to some of them and uh, yeah, gather some feedback whether we are on the right track and also to make sure that we do not interfere with the specification. So there was no formal meeting, as Sam said. Um, but from my point of view, when we are more or less sure that the the yeah we solved the most issues for OpenID for VCI and OpenID for P. Um, that's one of the next logical steps, I would say, to make sure that uh, people from OpenID uh, for VC know about it, understand, and hopefully help to make um, an additional spec out of it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and their involvement is certainly welcome, although the what we're proposing does not violate the specifications as written. Um, and so there's 
Um, in, in some ways, uh, it would be really helpful to have some involvement in, in other ways, as long as we're not violating the spec or preventing something from working, then you can kind of use this anyway. Um, so, so I think that's, that's important. A couple questions in the chat. Eric asks, once the DIDCOM channel is established, how long or where do you determine how long that channel persists? Um, that, uh, that within just the scope of being a DIDCOM issue um, is, is as flexible as the, as the participants require it. So uh, you might use it for a set period of time because you, you only uh, you know, desire or need interactions for, um, for, say, 24 hours after credential issuance. It could be something that you persist in the very long term as a relationship with that individual uh, for the communication ability. So that's entirely up to the, to the needs of the participants and, and not uh, in any way uh, specified by, by this work uh, specifically. Um, DIDCOM allows for, for any of those, you know, any length of time, including very short to, to forever if, if necessary. Um, the other question is, I'm new to DIDCOM, currently working on a wallet and issuance system based on OpenID for VCI protocol. Can you provide a few use cases which uh, point the benefits of implementa implementation DIDCOM additionally along with OpenID for VCI? Um, yeah, I'll, uh, let me attempt to rephrase a little bit what you said, Arthur, and then you can correct any um, anything that I get wrong there. Um, one of the nice things, uh, uh, so OpenID uh, typically starts from some passage of, of the invitation, and that's that's uh, commonly a QR code that's been displayed that the user scans. Um, if you uh, discover or you need to additionally issue some credentials to the individual, um, if you are going to do that with OpenID for VCI, you would need to scan another QR code um, or, or begin the process uh, anew. You would have to you know, restart the same process to issue a new, a new credential. Um, and the user would more or less have to be present in that same circumstance. It's also possible to email those links that hasn't been demonstrated as, as commonly. Um, with the ability to send messages containing all sorts of data and not just verifiable credentials allow you to message the, um, you know, the, the individual, an issuer can send a message to the, to the holder wallet to say, hey, I have another credential that I would like to offer you. Um, and that can happen regardless of whether the user is still looking at the screen with the QR codes that they were before. Um, and so you can message the user and say, I've got another credential um, that, uh, that I would like to issue you that can contain the OpenID invitation for issuance. And that invitation then can be used to start the OpenID process, but without the user having been present in the original circumstances where they were. So that means it could happen you know, immediately after the first issuance, but it could also happen five minutes later or a day later or a month later or you know, any, any necessary time as you may have something uh, to, to issue to the users um, or, or to, the, to the user. One of that could be a replacement credential. If the credential you, they, you uh, originally issued to them was a short-lived credential by design, it had an expiration date that, that perhaps lasted for a month, you would be able to use that mechanism to issue them a new credential without requiring that they sort of return and walk through the, that original uh, process again, um, which can be a, a really nice user experience uh, you know, for, the, for the user on that side. Um, it could be that you need to offer a corrected credential. Um, something has changed or some attribute that is in the credential is, is necessarily different. And so you can, um, you can, of course, revoke the old credential and notify the user of that over the DIDCOM channel, but also facilitate the issuance of a corrected uh, credential to the user as well. And all of that is without the user returning to the original circumstance they're in, which is either they're physically present and they're scanning something off of a computer screen at, at an office or something, or more likely they're sitting at their desktop um, uh, you know, computer to, to be able to arrange that. And so the, the flexible trusted channel that DIDCOM gives you allows you to engage in these sorts of activities um, in, a, in a way that is uh, substantially easier and can improve the user experience uh, from from simply going back to restart the the original open ID uh, issuance process. Yeah, I would like to add here something because another good example I had in mind. Um, so currently, the architecture reference framework mainly uh, prescribes the usage of SDJs as a verified credential format. And compared, for example, to to high Palencia um you have I mean there is some kind of lack of features regarding privacy because whenever you present an SDJ, it's more or less correlatable. So the idea is that you get issued more than one SD JOT credential when you get credentials issued by the issuer. And then if you always present a different credential, although the, the content of the credential is the same. One use case where uh, OpenID did come could help here is when you're running out of these kind of replicated credentials. 
the wallet could automatically request via Ditcom a new batch of credentials um, in the background without even you being notified about it just happening. And when you present the next time credential, you still have uh, valid credentials. I hope this makes sense. Yeah, uh, so uh, Damien asked, does, the, does work need to happen on wallets to enable them to display DIDCOM messages? Uh, the messages themselves are not typically displayed, um, but there may be content inside the messages that need to be displayed. Um, and so, uh, yes, on the on the wallet side, you would need to support, um, as part of this process, not only the protocol that we highlighted here, but then the, any other necessary protocol for the types of interaction. Uh, there's a popular one called basic message that could be equated to like a text message um, where you can send um, you know, text to the other party that is intended for human display. Um, but, uh, but some of the messages might contain other things like the, wa the wallet might automatically send a didcom message in the, in the previous example that, that Archer just gave to request another batch of sort of one-time presentation credentials to gain the privacy features. And then when those credentials are actually issued, you might not actually show anything to the user. They've already consented to receive the original credential and these are replacements, which means that the UX could streamline that process of, of accepting the credentials and then making them available for the next presentation that the user desires to do. And so sometimes there will be things to display to the users. Uh, sometimes there won't be, depending on their preferences or the, um, you know, the need for consent in a particular action um, or, or, you know, kind of what's happening. Um, also, for example, if you're going to issue a new batch of, say, five credentials so that you have, uh, you, you know, unique ones uh, that you can present, then um, uh, then you're unlikely to prompt the user each time you accept one of the five credentials in a batch. Um, you know, the consent that they that they gave to receive the credentials in the first place would cover the, the you know, the the new sort of um, the new batch of credentials to serve the same purpose. And so uh, and so again, there's some definitely some user experience things to um, to to consider. Um, one of the the nice things, and Kim is is, is hinting at this a little um, about Didcom, is the, is that uh, if you have a secure channel, there's all sorts of useful things you can do with it, including verifying other channels. Um, and so one of the one of the uses of Didcom in the past has been to um, uh, I shouldn't say the past, but in other areas, um, is to actually verify phone calls. Um, you can pass information over the Didcom channel to, to verify that you are, in fact, talking to the person you think you are on the other side, which can help with call center fraud and, and, a, and a large variety of those other things. Um, it can also pass, uh, you know, other uh, other relevant information. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of verifiable credentials as this, this really useful trusted data mechanism, which is all true, um, but sometimes the communication you might need with someone is doesn't have to be verifiable in that sense that something more flexible is is useful um, for example um, if i uh, if i receive a, uh, a a verifiable credential receipt of a purchase uh, at a store maybe I, maybe i go buy something and i want a verifiable credential to prove that i that i bought it and where i bought it um, you know perhaps for product registration reasons or, or, or warranty reasons or something then that store has the ability to uh, to you know be involved in messaging with a customer in different ways. The customer has control over this because they can you know block messages that they don't want or only allow certain types of interactions. But the ability to uh, communicate about say recalls or other types of information um, in the future um, is a is a really powerful feature. And the 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 fact that it's coming over this same trusted channel that you've established and 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 verified through verifiable credentials gives you the ability to, to trust the information that's coming, which, which goes a long way to, to solve phishing attacks. Because if I get a message about my car's extended warranty is the classic example, right? Um, from, from someone who is, is, uh, is either involved in subpar marketing techniques or, or you know, trying to scam me out of something, then it's easy to identify that the party sending the message is in fact not who they claim to be and, and we can use that both within our software, but also, you know, users can see, in, you know, information that helps them understand about the, the veracity of the communication that they're receiving. And that's one of the really powerful pieces of, of, uh, of using DINCOM for that purpose. These are excellent questions, by the way. I knew there were questions out there, so I'm, I'm glad that folks are asking them and, and happy to, to answer, you know, new questions as well. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Can I ask? Please. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very good uh, use case. Uh, both these things on communication as well as uh, the the interesting part was STJOT, where we can keep sending credential, which is used. So 
um that was very interesting but does it not require a human interaction again uh, to do that activity is my first question and second question is about uh, was that in reference to the channel persistence uh, if we say that channel persistence is for only for one hour so we can only uh, communicate or send credentials only for one hour if you want to keep it for a very long time like say 6 months or one year do we do we see a security issue or a performance issue if you keep it for a very large time uh all answer performance first there's not really the the amount of data to remember a connection with another party is very small you you basically retain their did um and uh, and and if necessary a cache copy of the you know the resolved did document um and so there's not really a performance issue it's like it's kind of like having more phone numbers in your address book isn't really a performance issue for making phone calls uh, in a, in, a, in a similar analogy to a phone um from a security perspective um there's not although for high assurance cases you may want to verify that the other user um might still have the authorization that you previously received from them so if uh, if you present a verifiable credential um that gives you some assurance of some property um you know that I'm Sam I'm, I'm an employee of a certain company well a year from now you you may want to re-ask me that to make sure that I'm like still you know employed by the same company um and so there that may be necessary uh, but there there's no degrading security properties of the of the relationship itself and then and then Archer you can you speak to the rest yeah i think um the first part whether it it does not require also user interaction um before you get new sdjot credentials issued um i think it depends right because because i don't know when it's a very important uh, credentials maybe as as i just said you have to re authorize yourself so you are still working for the company i don't know you have uh, still a um, citizen of this in this country uh, i think it depends but for other use cases i don't know way once in road in some kind of system which is not that important and you don't want to recheck periodically um yeah i, I really think it depends i mean it could work with some kind of permission model that the what uh, the wallet asks you after you establish it come connection would you like me to periodically update your credentials or get a new batch of credentials issued and for some issues who you trust you accept this so wallet is doing everything for you and for other use cases or other issues you do not trust that much you don't want the wallet um, to act on behalf of yourself um so i i would not be able to give a yes or no answer i think it really depends on the use case it's worth highlighting that with open id a, a new credential issuance does require user interaction they're going to have to scan a qr code or click a link or or something as part of that process um with didcom facilitating the passage of those uh, of those credential offer messages then you have the option if all the conditions are met like I was talking about the user has previously consented or 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 allowed that automatic action you're actually capable of of having like a reissuance of another batch of credentials that you already have that could actually happen without the user having to you know click accept five times or take some manual step in order to make it happen uh thank you my my question was also more relevant to open id for vci compliance so even if there is no user interaction and if we are able to achieve it we are still compliant that's how it is i i believe so um in the sense that the user's device is acting on their permission to receive an issued credential and um it depends a little bit on the way that the open id interaction is is required uh, the invitation may lead to some other step that's involved whether it's the pre auth flow or the auth flow um but the fact that the that the invitation arrived over didcom is not a is not a problem from the open id perspective they don't they don't indicate how uh invitations are to be transferred and so uh you know didcom as a transfer mechanism is certainly going to be more secure than sms or email for example um and then still launches into the open id flow for the completion of that protocol um and so there's there's no problem there um in terms of uh, you know like batch batch uh, issuance concerns and and whether they are um not only uh, one of the things that may happen and i i hope this doesn't but occasionally regulation requires uh, unfortunate things or they require things with unintended consequences and so for example you can imagine some legislation that requires that users must consent to receive a credential which is fine 
but may word it in such a way that indicates that no optimization of user experience is allowed, like the user can't sort of say, yes, I'll accept this batch of credentials, and then, you know, it be issued five or six, right? Um, and so it's possible that other factors will, will, will uh, handle this uh, or will, will affect this flow. Um, like regulation of that kind, but to my knowledge, there's no uh, existing problem um, with allowing the user to authorize their software to to do things on their behalf. I'll also note that having a process a credential issued to you is a lot less of a consent concern than presenting a credential. Um, I believe there's still circumstances where you could authorize your software to represent a credential to a particular party if you know if, if you if you authorize that automatic behavior. But presenting a credential is much more of a, of a consent concern than actually having a credential issued to you, so simply because you could you can always just throw it away. Like the fact that it's been issued to you is is not particularly uh, meaningful from a uh, from an information perspective. Maybe one thing to add here: Can you scroll a little bit down to the to the two diagrams? Yeah. Because the, uh, from these two here, or yes, the the authorization code flow and the pre-auth flow. Because from a technical point of view, I agree. Um, so when he, when we are doing the authorization code flow, you see uh, the it's between the second and the third step. There has to be some kind of user authentication content. So how this is done, that's not specified. So this more or less requires some kind of user interaction. But in the pre-auth flow, um, that happened before. And the only thing the user has to do is more or less to press a button. And that's also between the third and the fourth step. And this, I guess, could be automated when you gave your consent. So when you have an established ITCOM channel, which um, correlates to the OpenID VDI flow you had before, then the issuer knows, well, okay, this ITCOM channel is bound to this user, so I can send a new offer via ITCOM and it's pressing the button. That could be fully automated. So in the pre-auth code flow, uh, pre-authorization flow, I'm pretty sure you can automate almost everything, pretty sure everything. In the authorization code flow, maybe not, but still, this depends on your use case. That's a great answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That completely makes sense. One one small question is: the token request will go through the DITCOM or it will it will go to HTTP? In in no, the, it, in this exact it, flow, what you discussed. Second in, time. In, the, in this model, um, all of the these interactions are just the same Open ID protocols that you're familiar with. So there's no modifications at all to those. So to, to come down to this diagram, um, this flow here is, of course, uh, you know, purely um, open ID. And, um, and then the, the credential request portion as well that, you know, where you're completing the, the credential issuance is, is just exactly open ID the way that you'd expect. The only addition is the additional attributes of if we've discussed, and then this this didcom interaction that happens prior to that in the required flow, so that uh, you can correlate the didcom connection with the open id interaction so uh, there's no you know there's no modification to the open id protocols as far as you know the token request and response and credential request and response etc uh thanks sir. thanks Arthur. that makes sense thanks yeah. thanks for the question all right we have just a couple minutes left we probably have time for one more if someone had a question on the tip of their tongue All right. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, major thanks to to Arthur and to ID Union for not only being here to present today, but also doing amazing work um, and, uh, and and documenting it well. And uh, I should mention uh, we did not show it today, but there is actually a running code example. Oh, GitHub just gave up on my CSS formatting somewhere. Um, but there there is a, there is an installation guide on on how to actually do this. Um, the actual on-screen thing is not very interesting because it just happens really fast and everything else. Um, but of course, this is open source code, which allows you to go inspect what's actually been been done. Uh, the code is built with Veramo and the uh, and this with the Spherian um, and its didcom support, but also the Spherian uh, libraries um, as well. Um, we are uh, uh, Niels from Spherian is uh, is involved in the conversations as well. And so we're grateful for his involvement um, and, uh, and and his knowledge of the OpenID libraries that, of course, makes this not only you know technically true in spec form but also practically true in the implementation of of, uh, of code that enables this stuff to happen. 
so, so much thanks to, to, to Archer and ID Union uh, for funding and doing this work um, and, uh, and grateful to have them here today. Um, we, um, Archer and I will actually both be, and not only us, but, uh, but Kim and some others will be at, um, at EIC uh, in a couple of weeks um, and uh, the European Identity and Cloud Conference. Um, and so uh, we will be present there. Um, and of course, you're always, uh, you know, welcome to reach out uh, online with other questions or things that we can help you with. Um, and with that, Lamari, is there any any closing words that you have? I uh, will just say that I can make this available on YouTube. So in case anybody could not attend or you know someone who would be interested in this discussion, you can send it to them. So I should have that up soon and then we can get it out on our social media channels. Excellent. Thank you, Lamari. Thanks, folks, for coming. Appreciate all of you for being here, and we will see you all elsewhere on the internet or hopefully at some point in person. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye.